This is the start of our first ever SIM challenge at Flight Insight. Over the next few videos, we're going to go through an entire IFR flight from planning through execution and take you along for the ride in the sim. You could play along with us on your own sim or fly the real thing if you're nearby. For the first sim challenge, we're flying IFR from Yakima, Washington, Kilo Yankee Kilo Mike to Astoria, Oregon, Kilo Alpha Sierra Tango in our IFR GPS equipped Cessna 172. We asked you all for root ideas, and this one was recommended by the Vice President, Mr. Lockbox himself, Al Gore. If you have an idea for our next route, drop a comment here. So a successful flight begins with good planning, which is what this first video will be about. One of the hallmarks of good airmanship is making every possible decision on the ground before we fly, especially in the IFR environment. We'll use ForeFlight for our flight planning and reference it in flight in later videos. You can use Sky Vector as well as a great planning resource to do everything we'll demonstrate here. We're going to enter the airport pair into the search bar above. KYKM is our origin and KAST is our destination. Our first job is going to be to pick a route. Let's look at the big picture. If we tap on profile with this route already entered in, we can see that the terrain reaches its highest point at over 8,000 feet at Gilbert Peak and we'll be flying just north of Mount St. Helens further along this direct route. We'll need to be at 10,000 or higher to have a safe clearance. That's getting to be a bit much in our Cessna, both in terms of the ability of the aircraft to get to those altitudes and being in an unpressurized cabin that high up. Let's assume we don't have supplemental oxygen on board either. Additionally, we would want to look at weather to determine routes and altitudes. We're going to set our weather the same at our departure, destination, and en route environment to have a scattered layer at 3,000 feet and a broken, nearly overcast layer at 9,000. With the surface temps at 10 degrees Celsius, we would expect icing conditions, which our Cessna isn't equipped to fly through once we entered that layer at 9,000. This is another reason why we'll want to find a route that will allow us to fly a lower cruise altitude. Let's use the four flight route advisor. We tap routes, then look at ones previously cleared by ATC. These are the routes we're likely to be assigned in our clearance. The first route is close to a direct one. If we select it and look at the MEAs, we see the first airway, Victor 204, has a minimum en route altitude of 10,000 feet. This is higher than we'd like to be in our Cessna and puts us in the freezing clouds anyways. We'll skip over the direct route. The third route also includes that airway, Victor 204. The fourth, starting at Simcoe, is also mostly direct, which requires a higher altitude for the mountains. The fifth one is a southern route. Let's load it up and see. With MEAs at 7,500 and 7,000 feet, we'd be much better suited. It's a big diversion though. Is there a shorter route that still allows us to fly these lower altitudes? Here's another southern route that isn't as long. The minimum GPS equipped altitude is 7,000 at first, rising to 8,000. An appropriate cruise altitude of 8,000 feet for our westerly IFR flight will comply with these minimums. It does involve a departure procedure, the Chromo 4. Let's look at the plate for that to see what it entails and if we're able to fly it. This is an interesting one. It involves a DME arc that we need to intercept and fly until we pick up our route outbound. My personal preference is to read through the text-based description first, which is on the next page. The winds are westerly, so we'll expect runway 27 for departure. For that runway, it has us making a climbing left turn, thence, which just means and then from there, we intercept and fly out on the Yakima 250 radial to Gromo on the 9 DME and then along the assigned transition. Our route involves the hitch transition. Let's move back to the graphical depiction. From Gromo, we pick up the 9 DME arc and fly that around through Ogfa to Ogzob and then fly the 206 radial outbound to hitch. A note says that we should continue our climb to 8000 and hold at hitch if we need to. There are takeoff minimums for this SID. Runway 27 has us flying at least 380 feet per mile to 6,300 feet. Can we do this in our Cessna? Let's consult the performance tables. The maximum rate of climb table in section 5 of the POH lists feet per minute at given conditions. We're at 10 degrees Celsius at the airport's elevation of 1,000 feet. The procedure minimum has us maintaining that higher climb gradient until around 6,000 feet, which is where our performance will be worst. So let's look at the figure for that altitude. Losing 2 degrees per 1,000 feet of climb, we should be at 0 Celsius. We'll be at 430 feet per minute. Our indicated airspeed should be 73 at that altitude, 
which given an outside air temp of zero makes our true airspeed 79 knots. With that five degree headwind we're climbing into, the ground speed is 74 knots. The required climb gradient is 380 feet per nautical mile. If we divide 74 by 60 and multiply that by 380, we get a required climb in feet per minute of 468. This is a bit higher than what the performance tables say we'll be at here, which is 430. In order to keep our climb at the required gradient, we may consider transitioning from best rate to best angle of climb speed just towards the end of our climb to keep our rate closer to 500 feet per minute. If the conditions were any hotter than this, or if our aircraft struggles to make the numbers in this table, we may consider not flying this departure procedure. The Yakima 7 is another procedure here, which only requires a 325 foot gradient for runway 27 and only up to 5,000 feet. Let's stick with the Gromo 4 though. Let's do a NOTAM check at each airport. We're looking for taxiway or runway closures or amendments to instrument procedures, also any TFRs that would affect us. At Astoria, there is an amendment to the ILS for runway 26. It notes that the procedure turn isn't required at Zunab inbound to Zinke. There's another notum saying the VOR approach to runway 8 is not allowed. Let's have a look at possible instrument approaches into Astoria. The winds are westerly. Runway 26 seems favored. It has an ILS approach, which we just read the NOTAM amendment for. Let's read through this to see if there's anything we should take note of for later. The procedure involves a DME arc to get established inbound, but since we'll be approaching from the east, we would expect to be cleared direct either to Zunab, where that intermediate leg begins, or straight into Zinke. We saw in the NOTAM that no procedure turn is required if we start at Zunab, but we'd expect to do the course reversal if cleared direct to Zinke unless otherwise instructed. The glide slope intercept is 4,000, which for an airport that's at sea level is rather high. This means we'll be on the final segment of the approach for a long time, 12.3 miles to be exact. The decision altitude is 264, which is somewhat normal for an ILS, and the mist involves a climb to hold over the VOR on the field. There's a note that the procedure is not allowed for arrivals on airways off the Astoria VOR from the 024 radial clockwise through the 099 radial. That's anything on or between Victor 187 and Victor 112. We'll be flying inbound on Victor 112, so ATC may not assign us this ILS unless we get a radar vector or something else. There's also an RNAV into runway 26 with LPV minimums, which with our WAS-enabled Garmin 530 we'll be able to fly. Given the weather, we don't need to file an alternate, but we might consider Portland International close to our route of flight as a candidate. With all this information, we'll go and file our IFR flight plan. We're now ready to move on to the pre-startup checklist and look towards getting our clearance and departing, which will be covered in the next video in the series. Hope you can join us for that.